Hi, welcome to Social Neuroscience. This is lecture 16 on love and relationships. Now you'll notice that this lecture and the one that preceded it, lecture 15 on attraction, there isn't a chapter in Sapolsky devoted to these particular topics. In fact, some of the findings that are in these two lectures are sort of scattered throughout the book. Um, Sapolsky just didn't focus on this aspect of social behavior in his book. And so I don't have any assigned readings going along with these um, two lectures, um, but I'm gonna try to supplement it with some other data that you probably haven't come across before. So we'll look at love and relationships. We're also gonna sort of look at some other related topics to love and relationships. And one of those things I wanted to get into is human chemo signals. The idea that we may use smell, things that we pick up through our nose to affect our social behavior. So we'll be doing human chemo signals today. We'll talk about breastfeeding chemo signals, the smell of tears, and MHC compatibility. And then we will dive into love a bit. We'll talk a little bit about the psychology of love and then some early um, social neuroscience research about human love. And finally, we'll look at the importance of touch by loved ones. So let's take chemo signals first. What do we know about human chemo signals? Well, we'll start with this interesting paper that was published in Hormones and Behavior in 2004 by Spencer and colleagues. And you'll see the second author, author there is Martha McClintock. McClintock's been doing really interesting research on chemo signals for a long time. In fact, previous work that she did, she found menstrual synchrony among close friends who were living together in the same housing at uni. So this is back in 1971. Now, there are some problems in trying to replicate these findings. Some people found them, some people didn't. But the basic idea is that these women were assigned randomly to live together uh, as roommates in university housing. And within a few months, their menstrual cycles had become in sync in sync with each other, they were sort of synchronized. And this suggested that there was sort of some sort of olfactory cues that were, um, that these women were sensitive to that occurred during the luteal phase, and that therefore that was what's actually putting the synchrony in. Now the hypothesis of this new study, this 2004 study, was that women would be affected by the signals that come from lactation during breastfeeding, such that they would be more likely to want to have sex. Now, that might seem a very odd uh, finding, but there's an evolutionary explanation to it. And the idea is that when women were together in the hunter-gatherer uh, lives in these small bands, if one of the women was having a baby and lactating and therefore the, and sending out these chemo signals, that would signal the other women in the group that it's basically a safe time to have a baby. I'm having a baby right now, um, and therefore it's gonna maybe uh, enact sort of a drive or a motivation to want to get pregnant because we're now in a safe place, a safe location, there's plenty of resources, and then that would actually kind of get the, all the women in the group to be synchronized so they'd all want to um, mate around that particular time. Um, again, it might seem far-fetched, but remember that women during these hunter-gatherer times wouldn't necessarily have the language to be able to say things like I just said, like, hey, it's a good time to have a baby. And so maybe the chemo signals were actually uh, evolved during that period, and they still linger with us today as sort of like these remnant gadgets. Okay, So that's the explanation about why they would have expected that this, these signals would somehow affect women in wanting to have sex. And so the way they did this research was quite involving, quite, <laughs> quite uh, complicated. Um, what they did was they'd have women who were breastfeeding wear cotton pads over their nipples um, and they're regularly breastfeeding. And so then when they're done feeding their child, they put these cotton pads there and they keep changing the pads out all the time so that, that the researchers could then collect from these three lactating women. There are three lactating women they used for the entire study could keep creating these pads for them and then that way they could take the pad and and transfer it to rub it under the nose of a woman who was not pregnant and had no children so all the participants here were women who were not pregnant had no children they were basically attending university and what they did is they assessed their sexual motivation then for the next cycle and they also had a control group so none of these women were on the pill um, none of the women are sort of having any other interference here of uh, other chemicals that you might possibly affect their sexual drive. And so the idea is just what happens if you rub this underneath their nose. And so this is quite an evolving process. It meant that they had to have vials taken home where they'd have two pads per day. They would rub their um, pad underneath their nose in the morning and they would do it again just at bedtime before they went to bed. And then the control group has also got these two pads, but nobody can smell anything. There's nothing 
uh, that you can pick up about the pads. You're just rubbing the pad a little bit underneath your nose. So the ones that are in the experimental group are rubbing this um, remnants of this breastfeeding, whereas the control group's got nothing on their pad that they're rubbing against them. The experimenters were blind to the con conditions, so there was no demand characteristics. Um, and they even had the participants, all the participants come in twice a week to give them new vials. And then at that time, they would show them again how to properly rub this underneath their nose. Also, the women would be asked to keep track in, in uh, daily record logs about the time that they actually had rubbed their nose and so on. So they had it very, very controlled. Um, these women had to commit to doing this every day for three months, right? So it was a very involving study. They did pay them a couple thousand dollars in participation fees. So it was a well-funded study. Um, they did have people who dropped out who just couldn't handle all of the work involved in this. But keep that all in mind now as I show you what the results were. So what they did is they asked these women to indicate their sexual desire and their sexual fantasies every day. I should also mention that there was a cover story here. They told the participants nothing about pheromones or chemo signals or anything. They just wanted to see if these women were sensitive to smells during um, their menstrual cycle. So that's all the women were told is that you might have something rubbed underneath, the, underneath your nose that has a very subtle smell and we're just trying to see how it affects your behavior. So they, they don't know what the hypotheses are. They don't know that they're going to have breastfeeding uh, women rubbing you know stuff underneath their nose like that. Instead they're kind of given this variety of different smells that they could possibly be smelling but they again are not aware of it. All right, so what you see here now are the three months, the three different cycles that all these participants would have participated in. The open circles are the control group. The dark circles are the group that are getting the little pads that come from breastfeeding women. And up at the top, the top two graphs are baseline. So the first month, they just did this all one month, and both the control and the breastfeeding group are only having control pads put on their nose, okay? So during baseline, both groups, control and breastfeeding, just have the little pad rubbed underneath their nose twice a day and it's got nothing in the experimental group from the breastfeeding women or lactating, okay? Now, that's just the top two. And you'll notice that on the left, the left column are all ratings of sexual desire on some sort of visual scale they had. They would rate how much their sexual desire was. You can see that there's an increase of their sexual desire around the time of their surge of their luteinizing hormones. That's during their most fertile period. Um, and then you can also see the number of sexual fantasies that they have over on the right, okay? So there really isn't a difference though between the control and the breastfeeding groups. Now, we look at these two bottom graphs. This is the next month, cycle one, and the month after that, cycle two. So for the entire next two months, these participants are now rubbing their noses again every day, twice a day. But the breastfeeding participants are getting breastfeeding um, smell underneath their nose, okay? And you can see what's happening is that the people who are in the breastfeeding condition on the left, their sexual desire is starting to go up. It keeps increasing and you'll see that it's different than from the people who are in the baseline condition, the control condition, I should say. And that continues on into the second month. So in the second cycle, you can still see that these women have higher sexual desire overall than the women who are in the control group. And then over on the right, the sexual fantasy measure, you can see it takes a while there. There isn't really much of a difference between the two groups in terms of sexual fantasies, but the women who are having the breastfeeding stuff rubbed underneath their nose, they're the ones that are starting to show increased sexual fantasies. And that stays fairly high even through the second cycle, the next one, the third month of the study. So pretty fascinating stuff that these women are not conscious of the fact that they actually have any sort of breastfeeding compound underneath their nose and yet it's affecting their sexual desire, it's affecting their sexual fantasies, and therefore the data are consistent with this explanation that if in our evolutionary history, women in small groups were together and um, could smell each other's breastfeeding, lactation, it would have increased sexual desire and sexual fantasies. All right. If you have any questions about that study, um, first of all, you can go look it up. Try to find that study. It's, I've given you the reference there a couple slides back. It's a really pretty fascinating study. And secondly, we can always talk about it at the workshop. Now, here's another example of possible chemo signals where smells could affect behavior. Now, that last study was just all women. What about this one? This one tries to argue that in human tears, when people cry, there are smells given off in the tears, chemo signals. This paper was published in Science, one of our premier journals, in 2011, okay? Gelstein et al. 
And what they did was they found a group of women who could cry fairly easily when they watched films and things. So while they're watching these films and they start to cry, the Gelstein et al. researchers would collect these women's tears in little vials. So they have these little pot of tears from women who are crying emotionally to films. Okay. Then when they've got enough tears in a little vial like that, they can take a little pad and stick the pad into the tears and get it kind of damp and then put it underneath a man's nose like you see here. So now you've got a male who's got this little pad there, it's a little moist underneath his nose. And he can't smell anything, so it's very much like that last study with the breastfeeding compound. There's no particular distinct smell of tears. Um, and there was also a control condition where they would take that little pad and stick it into saline. And so you just got basically salt water on the thing. Neither one of those two conditions could a participant tell the difference between the two pads. Um, and then what they were asked to do is look at pictures, different stimuli. And so for instance, they looked at this woman here and then you would rate if you were that male in the study, to what extent is this face sad? Not at all to vary, okay? And also they would show them pictures of female faces and ask these males to rate, to what extent is this face sexually arousing? So you got sexual arousal, ratings of sadness, and sometimes in one of the conditions, the males had tears underneath his nose, in another condition, he's going to have just saline, right? So it's um, the same guy. He's being tested twice, whether he's going to have saline underneath his nose or he's going to have um, tears underneath his nose. And what they look at then is their sexual arousal rating as a function of before and after smelling tears and sal smelling saline. The, the correlation here is just trying to show you that what happened at baseline versus what happened when they had sniffed some tears was that the more the guy rated um, the pictures of sexual arousing during baseline, the more they did this after they sniffed tears. And there wasn't such a strong relationship when they smelled the saline. But if you look there at those little bars, the little bar charts, you'll see that it's actually saying that the men's sexual arousing overall was lower when there were tears compared, compared to baseline. So in the two blue bars, notice that baseline is, again, smelling saline, tears as they're smelling women's tears underneath their nose. And while they're rating these pictures of women who for sexual arousal, the men rate the women having lower, uh, they have lower sexual arousal for those women than they do in the baseline condition. Over in the other condition, the other comparison, you can see with the red bars, you can see that saline doesn't do this. It's just not a significant difference, no significant reduction in the sexual arousal rating. Now, the other thing they measured was testosterone. So in one of these studies, they actually were able to measure the guy's testosterone levels. And again, let's just focus on the little bar charts there. You can see that in the baseline condition, you can see what the um, number of subjects they have here in terms of um, their mean, uh, I'm sorry, that's the mean testosterone levels. And you can see that um, the higher the level there on the y-axis, the higher they are, their um, mean testosterone. And you can see that for the tears condition, they have lower testosterone levels. So what's happening is smelling the tears is causing their testosterone levels to drop, whereas under the baseline condition, it's like of the normal weight, normal height or whatever. Um, over there on the right, you can see the same thing again for the participants um, in the baseline condition versus saline. Saline doesn't really reduce it. That's not a significant drop. So testosterone was basically the same whether you sniff saline or you, smell, you were sniffing uh, things in the baseline condition. So it doesn't matter. Um, what really matters here is that the tears are actually reducing the testosterone according to their analyses. Finally, they had a study in this package, in this paper, in which they looked at these particular participants in an fMRI scanner. And what you can see here is while they're looking at pictures of women, um, again, and thinking about them in terms of sexual arousal, you can see that there's a difference between saline and tears in the top two, or sorry, in A and D, the top graph and the bottom graphs there. The top graphs is the hypothalamus. And some research early on has suggested that sexual desire, sexual interest is sort of peaks more in the hypothalamus. Just overall, the hypothalamus shows more activity during sexual arousal. So they found greater hypothalamic um, activity in the fMRI scanner under the saline, sorry, under the yeah, under the saline condition compared to tears. That tears actually diminished the response to the stimuli. So there, you remember, these are the same stimuli, they look at them and they don't think they're very sexually arousing when they've been smelling tears. 
with the saline solution, they see these women and they get more sexually aroused, so they have higher hypothalamic activity. The one down at the bottom is um, is the fusiform gyrus, and again, fusiform gyrus activity is showing a difference here that for tears, in the tears condition, the fusiform gyrus is smaller than it is um, compared to the saline condition. So what this is all telling us across these studies is that, first of all, tears seem to be reducing sexual arousal, tears seem to reduce your testosterone levels, and the smell of tears is reducing areas of the brain that would be engaged normally in um, evaluating sexual arousal, looking at pictures of women in terms of their sexual arousal. So overall, that suggests that tears diminish sexual desire, and that's probably why it got into science. You think about all that, that's really fascinating, right? Because the little smell of tears given off by women is having this profound impact on men who are not even there with her. That woman who's got the tears, it was just the tears are collected in a vial, put on a little pad, and put underneath his nose, and now here he is days later, and he's smelling um, these tears, and it's having this effect. What's going on there? In the discussion section of that paper, they say, these findings pose many questions. What is the identity of the active compounds in the tears? Now, what's fascinating about that is that basically there is no known compounds in the tears that possibly could do this. Like there's no um, particular chemical that we know of in tears besides the saltiness of the tears and maybe a little bit of fat that would actually convey this information about the fact that the woman's crying. So they don't even know. Like they ran the study without even a, a, a sort of like a prediction about what that would be. They say, do chemo, chemo signals in women's tears signal anything else but sexual disinterest? And is this signaling restricted to emotional tears alone? So they're saying, is it something about the fact that the reason why men's sexual desire goes down and the testosterone levels drop when there's tears, is it because is it the women are just signaling, hey, I'm not interested in sex, and that somehow gets conveyed through their tears? And moreover, could the emotional or the hormonal state of the choir experimenter influence the outcome? And so basically, there's a lot of open-ended questions here. And they say the current results conclusively demonstrate a chemo signal in the human tears. What that signal is, we don't know. We don't even know what the compound is. And the paper gets published in Science. Well, you can kind of tell maybe from my tone, I'm a little skeptical, skeptical of these findings. Um, and what's funny about this study, though, is, of course, it gets all sorts of media attention. So as soon as a paper gets published in science, you see things like this. Women's tears tell men to back off. Study finds they dampen sexual desire, lower testosterone levels. Women's tears kills men's sex drive. Uh, please don't cry. It upsets a man's sex drive. Tears are a turnoff for men. In women's tears, a chemical that says, not tonight, dear. And finally, um, here, study finds what women already knew. <laughs> so it seems to be from this one study, now there's all this information out there that, wow, there's something about women's tears that basically causes men to not want to have sex, right? So I guess it's, you know, like some of these are suggesting if the woman really doesn't want to have sex, she should just cry. And then the smell of the tears is going to cause his sexual desire to drop. His testosterone levels are going to go. And again, we don't even understand what the mechanism is, but this study um, got a lot of attention. Well, what happened though, is that others then tried to figure this out. Others tried to replicate this finding. I can tell you, by the way, that the original uh, researchers still haven't, um, Gelstein has, still hasn't, I've, as I know right now, they haven't actually done any replications of this particular study. Here's a study that was published in Cognition and Emotion a few years later. And what these researchers did was try to replicate as best they could the um, same methodology that had been used in that previous study. And basically, they could not replicate this. You can see that what they're basically saying is that no matter what they did to try to do exactly the same thing, they found no effects of women's tears, like when they collected tears in little vials rubbed underneath men's noses. Now, this study didn't have any fMRI in it, but they didn't see any effects on ratings of sexual arousal, ratings of more sexually stimuli, sexual stimuli versus the ones that they had in this study. Nothing seemed to replicate. They, in fact, even contacted Gelstein and the, those colleagues in Israel and asked them for input. And basically, I think Gelstein et al. said, you're going to have to come to our lab in Israel. We'll show you exactly how to do this. Of course, these people are in the Netherlands. And they said, no, we're not going to come down to Israel. We don't have any money for that. So there was sort of a disagreement. Did these guys actually follow exact same procedures? But anyway, I, I think that this study really did as best job they could to try to replicate the same procedures and did not find a replication of that paper in science. So 
I think it's sort of out there. Uh, the, the jury is out whether or not there really are any chemo signals in tears. But I'll leave you there with that to kind of chew over. Now let's look at one more type of chemo signals, and this has to do with what's called MHC compatibility. This is something that's been already well documented in rodents, and in fact, in chapter 10 of Sapolsky, he talked a little bit about this in a discussion of evolution, that rodents might be seeking out um, other rodents who don't have MHC compatibility, and they do this through the smell and the olfactory system. So what MHC is, is that stands for the major histocompatibility complex. And this is a set of genes that code for the markers that the immune system uses to discriminate itself from pathogens. So this is really important to be able to know like when a pathogen has entered your body, when a virus or something has entered your body, your body needs to recognize that this is a pathogen, a foreign substance, and then basically attack it with the immune system, right? So the MHC is basically this, this sense of these codes, a highly, por highly polymorphic um, set of codes here for the markers that are gonna make your immune system work. And it turns out that two unrelated people are unlikely to possess identical MHC genotypes. In fact, we seem to prefer MHC dissimilar people as mates, as do rodents. And the question is why and how? Well, the why would be that if, if I mate with somebody who's MHC dissimilar from me, my offspring then are more likely to have a wider range of the MHC com uh, com compatibility complex. It'll make their immune system more robust, right? If I end up with somebody who's got almost identical MHC uh, to me, then it means that our offspring are not going to really have as much of a set of tools here that you could get from two parents that were really different in their MHC um, to be able to fight off viruses and other things, any other pathogens. So that seems to be the selection pressure that we would prefer to mate with people who are MHC dissimilar. And MHC similarity would not be preferred. So how would humans go about doing this? We don't go around and say to people, tell me, what's your MHC, right? And so the idea here is that maybe we do this through smell. And this is one of the first studies that did this back in 95, um, Klaus Wiedekind, okay? And they did this smelly t-shirt study. So what they did is they presented t-shirts that had been worn by men overnight to female sniffers. <laughs> so these guys wore these t-shirts, go to bed, come back to the lab the next day and bring their t-shirts to the lab. And then they're gonna basically ask women to smell those t-shirts. And the women were tested during their follicular phase of their cycle. And what they found was that they tended to prefer the smells of MHC dissimilar men to MHC similar men. Now, how would they know they actually are dissimilar or similar? What they do is they give blood tests. They take blood from the female sniffers and blood from the men who wore the t-shirts. And then you can actually look through um, in a blood test whether or not the MHC is similar or dissimilar, okay? So right there, you can see it looks like, wow, these women smell these t-shirts and they say, oh, I like to smell that guy. Oh, I don't like the guy who smells there. The ones that they tend to like are the ones that are more dissimilar to them. And the ones that they don't like are the ones where the MHC was similar to them. Interestingly, in that 95 study was that women on the pill did not show this preference, all right? So women who were on the pill, perhaps due to like the pregnancy mimicking effect of the pill, basically showed no differentiation in what they cared about, about MHC dissimilar and similar men. And I think when that study came out, people were concerned. They said, well, gee, maybe this, this contraception is actually interfering with the normal process of how uh, men and women, or how women would choose their mates um, based on MHC similarity or dissimilarity. So you can see here, here's not taking contraception in terms of how pleasant dissimilar and similar men was. It's the stuff on the left. And you can see over on the right that when they're on the pill, there's just no difference between the two groups. So, sorry, the, between whether the t-shirt is dissimilar or similar. So it looked like contraception is interfering with the sort of natural process, or at least I'm talking about the pill here, um, this kind of contraception is actually interfering with the normal way that women might select a partner based on MHC similarity, dissimilarity. Now, what about what happens though if you did make a mistake? Like let's say, like this research seems to suggest you're on the pill and you end up with a guy who is actually MHC similar. Does that really have any impact then? So what this study showed in psychological science in 2006 is they wanted to look at how MHC compatibility is related to things like sexual responsivity in the couple and unfaithfulness in these romantic couples. So they tested some hypotheses about women in MHC similar couples. 
they thought if you're now paired up with somebody, maybe by mistake, you didn't smell them properly, and they're MHC similar to them, it still could be the case that you won't be as sexually attracted to them because maybe there would be sort of like a compensatory response that you just want to want to have sex with this person because they're MHC similar. So they, they hypothesized that the more MH similar you were in a couple, the more you'd be less sexually responsive, that you'd be more likely to have had extra pair of sex, that is you'd be cheating, and that you'd be more attracted to other men, extra pair of men, particularly during the fertile phase of the cycle. So this is gonna require that you take each couple and then you measure their MHC, figure out if they're really MHC similar or dissimilar, right? So here's the results of that study from 2006. And we can look at, for instance, frequency of six, sex. And you can see that the degree to which these two shared MHC, so the more they shared their MHC, the more compatible they were, the negative correlation tells us the frequency of sex was lower. So there already is an, uh, a negative relationship between the amount of MHC sharing and how much the frequency of sex is. And you can see that um, there's also differences there between high fertility and low fertility sessions over on the right. Now, another thing that was the women's report of having an orgasm. And you can see that MHC sharing, again, was negatively correlated. So the more the woman actually um, shared MHC with the uh, male partner, the less was that she likely that she was going to report an orgasm. And um, in terms of rejecting the male, like when he's trying to initiate sex, you can tell that, that the more they have MHC compatibility, the more likely she's going to reject the male when they have sex. And in terms of complaining about sex, uh, I'm sorry, women's compliance sex, I'm sorry, what women's compliance sex is where the woman just basically says, all right, I'll have sex with you, but they're not really into it. Okay. And so in those relationships where basically the guy initiates it and she says, okay, I'll do it even though I don't really want to, um, you can see that there's a positive correlation. She's more likely to do that the more their MHC is compatible. So this really calls into question the whole idea is that, may, wow, maybe you should go ahead and get blood tests and figure out if you're MHC compatible or, or not before you actually start dating. Again, the idea is that we would do this through our smells and the woman's gonna be able to make the proper pick here based on the smell of the guy's t-shirt or whatever. Uh, but because of maybe the pill, it interferes with that process and you could end up with this. Finally, here's one more finding from that study in 2006 that the um, female's sexual responsivity of the partner was negatively correlated there. You can see that how responsive she is to him, the more that they share MHC compatibility, the lower their um, responsivity is to their partner. So interesting findings, and you can see how some of this fits in with evolution pressures. That again, it's maybe has something to do with um, pressures to keep our offspring uh, more to have stronger immune systems, and that could be what drives all of this. Now, this whole thing about MHC is also quite interesting because it's more controversial than I made it out sound to be. So here's, for example, a study that was published in 2008. And this really starts to make you question what the whole MHC thing is, okay? So MHC correlated odor preferences in humans and the use of oral contraceptives. So what they did in this study is they really tried to follow what Vedekin had done and others uh, to the T. They had 97 heterosexual men wearing t-shirts for two nights and then gave them to the researchers. Then the 97 women that they had in the study participated, some of them were on hormone-based contraceptive uh, contraception like um, Depo-Provera, and others were not, right? So they got some women who are on, on the contraception, others who are not. Everyone provi provides a blood sample to measure MHC compatibility. And then the women ended up smelling three MHC compatible t-shirts and three MHC non-compatible shirts. And they rated them for odor, pleasantness, intensity, and desirability. For desirability, like you're smelling a t-shirt, it says, based on this smell, how much would you like this man as a long-term partner? Okay, so those are the three ratings that the woman makes after she smells these six different t-shirts. Now, what they did was they looked at um, them in terms of whether or not they were taking the pill. So what they were, what they did is they recruited a group of women where some of the women were planning to go on the pill sim and other women were not, all right? And none of the women at session one are actually on the pill, okay? So at the first session, they get tested. None of the women are on the pill, but there's a group of women who intend to go on the pill soon, like at the next cycle in the next month. So we can divide them up in terms of those women who are 
going to go on the pill and those women who are not on the pill, okay? Or not planning to go on the pill. So that's what I mean here by non-pill and pill group. Although at this point, everybody is not on the pill. So what do we see when they look at those, smell those t-shirts and rate them? And you can look to see if there's a bias. Do they prefer the t-shirts that are more dissimilar or the t-shirts that are more similar? And if the bar goes up, that means that the person's more likely to choose a dissimilar um, person. So what we see is for the people that are in the non-pill, they actually show a little bit of similarity um, reference, right, for pleasantness. But the women who are not planning, I'm sorry, who are on the, who are currently not on the pill, but are planning to go on the pill soon, those women are actually the ones that show already a preference for dissimilar um, MHC t-shirts. For intensity, like how intense is this smell? You can see that the women who are planning to be on the pill, but are not currently on the pill, are the ones that also think that they, they find the t-shirts that have dissimilar MHC more compatible. And finally, for desirability, how much would you wanna have this guy as a long-term partner? You can see that the women who are not on the pill actually show a preference for similar t-shirts. And it's the women who are planning to go on the pill that are the ones that show the dissimilarity preference. So even though none of these women are actually on the pill, their intentions about whether or not they're gonna go on the pill next month is already being found here at this baseline session. And then when they actually start taking the pill, they come back into the lab. And so now the pill takers are taking the pill. The non-pill people are still not on the pill. And again, they do the same task where they go ahead and smell the t-shirts. You can see that even while they're on the pill, they're still picking MHC dissimilar men and in terms of intensity and in terms of desirability. It's only in the desirability where we see a flip where it goes down a little bit where when they're on the pill, their desirability is dropping and they're actually preferring more similar t-shirts. So the pill is actually having an effect there on their desirability rankings, but it doesn't change their pleasantness and their intensity. So it tells us that perhaps it's not all about the smell. It might also have a lot to do with what the woman's plans are right now, what her immediate or long-term goals are and whether or not she's then receptive or being affected by the odors that she smells in men in terms of their MHC compatibility. So this is a, one of those interaction effects that Sapolsky likes to talk about. What's the effect of MHC smell, you know, the smell here that uh, in terms of um, a woman's desirability here? Well, it depends on her goals, whether she's planning to um, have sex, because I would assume that the women here who are going to choose to take the pill back at session one are women who are planning to have sex. Um, whereas the non-pill women, maybe for whatever reasons, they're not planning to be sexually active yet. And so because they're not sexually active, they're not as influenced by what's going on. So it just tells you that the whole picture is a little bit more complicated than just smell and just whether or not you're on the pill. It's also probably has something to do with your short-term and long-term goals. Okay, moving on. I wanna go ahead and just now talk a little bit about love, just sort of a, do a deep dive about the psychology of love. Um, it's funny, uh, you would think that this would be something where it'd be ripe for really good research in social neuroscience when you think about things like love is a drug. So what about love? Well, love has actually been studied in psychology for a long time. Um, the Kind of the major people who did the work on this were back in the 70s. This was Elaine Hatfield, who was then called Walster. She and her husband published research, or some of the first people to do research about love in psychology. And they defined love in two different ways. They One kind of love, they called it passionate love, which they said is a state of intense longing for union with another. It's accompanied by a state of profound physiological arousal. So you have this cognitive aspect to it, but you also have this physiological aspect to it. And they talked about reciprocated love. It's associated with fulfillment and ecstasy. So when the person loves you back, it's even better. It's really positive. Whereas unrequited love, where the person doesn't love you back, is full of emptiness, anxiety, or despair. Companionate love is a different kind of love, and this is the affect that we feel for those with whom our lives are deeply entwined. So this could be, for instance, a close friend, it could be family members, and the idea here is it's not physiologically or psychologically as intense as passionate love is. Now you can measure a person's passionate love or their companionate love 
using a scale like this. This is the passionate love scale. And so what you're supposed to do is imagine if you are measuring someone's passionate love for their partner or this person that they supposedly are in love with, even if it's not reciprocated, you would fill in their name, you would fill in the blank here with their name. So I would feel deep despair if Joan left me. I feel happy when I'm doing something to make Joan happy. I yearn to know all about Joan. Joan always seems to be on my mind. I possess a powerful attraction for her. I get extremely depressed when things don't go right in my relationship with Joan. So basically you would go through all those items and get a score and it kind of tells you how high your passion, passionate love is, how intense it is. And some of the items have to do with physiological sensations and others have to do more with this kind of cognition intensity. And it's interesting, some early research back in the 80s on this showed some kind of cross-cultural work here where they were looking at the differences between men and women. Women generally score higher on the passionate love scale. There's one place where they found a difference and that was Filipinos where men actually had higher scores than women. Um, this is interesting. You might look at that and go, Caucasians, continental USA, Caucasians, Hawaii. That's because Elaine, Elaine Hatfield and her students were, who designed this passionate love scale, Elaine Hatfield was at the University of Hawaii. And that turned out to be an excellent place to collect data because you got all these tourists and people coming in from other countries like Filipinos and Japanese. And so they didn't actually have to travel anywhere. Just when these people were on holiday, they asked them to fill out these questionnaires. All right. So another thing that Hatfield and her colleagues have done is try to look at the longitudinal aspect of passionate love and companionate love. And you can see here that what they've done is they've looked at different people who are currently just dating, like they've been together for a few months. You find other people, this is by the way, cross-sectional research. So this is people who had just gotten married and it's just after their wedding. Then we have one year later, and you can see these are people who've been married for at least a year. And then finally, they had a group of participants who on average had been married 33 years, and they divided those people up into those who've been married less than 33 years and those who've been married more than 33 years, okay? So these are all the different time periods. Some of it I think is longitudinal, I can't remember now, and some of it is cross-sectional, obviously, because they're not gonna wait around 33 years to collect these data. But basically, they go ahead and ask these men and women to go ahead and fill out the companion and passionate love scales. And you can see that in uh, the period of dating, that companion love is pretty high for both men and women. And when you get to just after the wedding, companion love is at its peak. So they've just gotten married. Women have it really high there. Men have it fairly high. But on, um, sorry, that's companion love that's actually gone up. Passionate love is also sort of peaked. It's, uh, it's, it is its highest, and there's no difference between men and women in terms of their passionate love. Then as time goes on, those red lines that represent passionate, line, passionate love, you can see one year later, um, there's already a lowering of passionate love. And then when you get to less than 33 years and more than 33 years, you're really seeing passionate love keep dropping. So it looks like passionate love drops over time, that that intensity, that physiological arousal just keeps going down over time. Whereas the companionate love, this love that you feel with for, towards somebody that you're sort of bound up and entwined with, this can still occur for your partner, this person that you're married to. You can also measure their companionate love. And you can see that these, these participants still have high companionate love across this long, long time course. So it suggested, suggests then that um, although passionate love starts to fade with the years, companion love can stay really high and keep that marriage, that relationship together, right? So that's sort of the difference between companion and passionate love, that both of them could, you could have those, both of those for some person who's really important to you, but it looks like for most people, passionate love's going to decline, but hopefully the companion love stays nice and high. Now, is love just a bunch of chemicals? Um, and chemical interactions. That's what a lot of the songs seem to say. And we can answer this question by saying no. We can say that there's a lot of strong cognitive, social, and cultural influences about how love is. In fact, um, the culture of love is really fascinating in terms of history of when did um, different civilizations even recognize something called love. Love is defined differently in different cultures even today. Um, love and happiness are gonna be strongly linked to each other. And much of what happens in love is really still very little understood by science. That is, we still don't do a lot of really good research yet on what happens in love. But you can also say that yes, it's also going to be relevant in terms of the fact that there's probably specific hormonal and brain changes that are gonna be associated with sex and love. We talked a lot about those things with sex so far. Love, it's a little bit harder to do. Now, I just wanted to say before I show you this next study, Think about the challenge of trying to measure love in the laboratory. 
That is, you want to go ahead and see like what the underlying chemistry is and understand hormones and how the brain acts with love. But you're going to have to have a control condition, right? Because you want to be able to know, um, it, could this just be the way you feel about anybody who is close to you? Or is it when you're in love that you have this particular pattern of responses? So it's very often hard to come up with a good control condition where you could say, I, uh, that this is love, romantic love versus sort of companion love. And also keep in mind that it's hard to kind of sometimes get rid of the, or control for sexual attraction. And the fact that the control person might be somebody that you're not sexually attracted to, so you don't know how much of it's sex versus love. So just as a challenge, a methodological challenge, this is tough to do. So here's a group that attempted to do this. And this study got a lot of attention. I, I would have to say, personally, I don't really like this research. I don't think it's particularly well done. But I have to give them credit for trying it, for trying to do something, okay? So it's a very small sample in this study. They had 10 women and seven men who they said were intensely in love, all right? So they found that, on average, these 17 participants had been with their partner 7.4 months together. And they all completed that passionate love scale that I just showed you about their partner all looked at photos of their loved one and then a neutral same-sex familiar person. So they're going to be in the scanner, an fMRI scanner, and they're going to look at photos of their loved one and a neutral same-sex familiar person. So obviously the participant has to bring these photos to the lab. They're going to bring photos of their loved one and then they were asked to figure out somebody who's same-sex, who's familiar to you and that you don't, you're not in love with. And the hypothesis here was that the same areas that are involved in reward would be active for intensive love and not the areas having to do with sexual attraction. So nucleus accumbens, striatum, and caudate nucleus. You shouldn't find, for example, that um, intense love would be related to the hypothalamus. It's usually found for sexual attraction. So what did they do? They looked in the scanner and had them do these pictures. They had their passionate love scale scores for that partner. And you can see that in this particular um, uh, finding, they're looking at the anterior medial caudate body was correlated with the passionate love scale. So the more their passionate love goes up in terms of their passionate love scale score, the more you're seeing activity in that um, area when they look at that loved one compared to a neutral person. And then also you can see that the length of time that they've been in love was correlated with activation in specific areas. So you can see the more time that they've been with this person, that's what B and D are showing you. You can see that in the uh, indi indications here in these two graphs for A and C, A is the retrosplenial cortex, okay? It's part of the cortex there. And then they, that they say is similar to the region correlated with satiation while eating chocolate. So they're basically saying the more you're, you've are you been with this person and then you look at a picture of them in the scanner, the more the area that also becomes active when you eat chocolate is active. And then finally down at D there, they can show you the correlation between the bold response in the um, anterior cingulate and the posterior cingulate and the Ross and the posterior cingulate. Um, sorry, the yeah, the posterior cingulate cortex and the posterior cingulate BA30 retrosplenial cortex. So what they're trying to show you there is that, again, those areas in the cingulate become more activated the longer you've been with that person when they're in the scanner. Now, in the discussion, they really try to go through a very convoluted explanation about why it is that these particular areas are all lit up. And they talk about passionate love is involving um, pleasure like you get, you get with chocolate, but it also involves um, other sorts of bonding and things like that. To tell you the truth, I don't really know what these findings actually mean. I don't think that they map on extremely well um, to anything like their hypotheses or anything else that we would know or expect. But like I said, it's a good first step. There have been a few other studies since then. This was sort of the leading study. But again, I just bring back this question. Think about how to study romantic love in the social neuroscience laboratory. It's tough. It's really hard to figure out how to do this properly, to look at brain activity or hormones or whatever it is when you're talking about romantic love. And so I think that's why you don't see more good science done on romantic love. I'll hold that thought because it could still be possible in the next year or two that there'll be some really good studies that I'll get excited about. But for now, I haven't really seen that kind of research done well. So the last topic I want to look at today is why do we hold hands with our loved ones? And this is a really a fascinating question because, you know, people who are in love or people that you care a lot about, you often hold their hands. And so this brings up the whole importance of touch. James Cone has written about this. Um, he has a social baseline theory. 
which kind of actually fits very well with some of the loneliness research of Cassiopo. He's arguing that mammals are hardwired to assume close proximity to conspecifics. So you want to be near other people um, of your species. We're sort of um, want to be near them. It's like our default state. And so um, when somebody um, uh, is not around us and when we don't have that proximity, we feel more threatened. So we like to have people who are close to us to touch us, to have that touch because it tells us that everything is safe. Okay. So the way he looked at this back in 2006 was he had 16 highly satisfied married couples come to the lab. And you can see the um, mean ages of the men were 33 and 31 respectively. 15 couples identified themselves as Caucasian, one identified themselves as Asian. They were all in Madison, Wisconsin, okay? And then what happened was they put the woman in the scanner. And the woman was going to be, while she's in the scanner, she's going to see different lights come on, like a blue or a yellow light. And the, the light indicates a chance that you may be shocked. So there's a little shock sensors attached to her ankle. And so she's told that if that color light comes on, there's a 20% chance that you'll get shocked. Okay. And I think, in fact, they never shocked anybody in the study, but they threatened them with shock by having these electrodes attached to their um, ankle. If the other color came on, it was a safety cue. And that meant that no, when the, no, there's no chance of getting shocked. Okay. So you're going to either have a threat or a safety cue. And another thing they do is while they're going through these trials in the scanner, they ask them to hold the hand of their partner, their husband, who came with them to the lab. So there's going to be a block where you're holding your husband's hand. There's going to be a block of trials where you're not holding anybody's hand. And finally, there was a block where you were holding a stranger's hand. Okay, so you hold your spouse's hand, you hold a stranger's hand, or you don't hold a hand at all. And then you go through that trial where you think you might get shocked or not. And then there's a rest period. And during the rest period, they make some ratings about how they feel, about how aroused they feel, how um, unpleasant that was just to go through what they just did. Okay, so we can see this is self-report behavioral data. We can see what happens when they are have that threat of shock when there's no hand attached to their hand, they're not holding anybody's hand, you can see that that's an unpleasant trial. They don't like doing that. And when they look at their arousal, they feel physiologically aroused because they felt threatened that they might get shocked even though they never were. But you can see when they're holding their spouse's hand, the feelings of unpleasantness is lower. It's significantly lower. They've got a drop there when they're holding their spouse's hand. And they also feel less bodily arousal. If the stranger's holding their hand, it doesn't have the same effect. You can see that it's almost the same unpleasantness as if they have no one holding their hand. It did make the arousal level drop a little bit, but it's still much better to have your spouse hold your hand than it is to have a stranger hold your hand. Now, what about what actually happened in the scanner? Well, what they did was they, again, very much like that last study, kind of looked at the, um, uh, like the passion love scale. Here they're going to use... Uh, what's called the dyadic um, adjustment score, which is basically a score that kind of says how good your relationship is. So the wife and the husband fill out these questionnaires that basically kind of measures um, how things go along in your relationship. Are you good at solving problems together? Do you still feel love for each other? So on. And you can see that a higher score on this would mean that you had better relationship quality. So these are just the wife's scores on this, okay? And you can see that in that part that I have uh, indicated in red there, when she's holding her spouse's hand, there are negative correlations here between her score on the dyadic adjustment score and the intensity of those three different brain regions. So basically in the trials where she feels like she's gonna be threatened, she might be shocked, her activity in her right anterior insula, the left superior frontal gyrus and the hypothalamus are higher. She gets more activity in those areas because she thinks she might get shocked. But her activity goes down if she is holding her spouse's hand and their relationship is good. She has a higher dyadic score. So you can see that in all those cases, the higher, the better the quality of the relationship she has with her spouse and he's holding her hand, the less activity she shows in those three areas. You can see the just the reverse happens when it's no hand or a stranger hand. Um, in fact, it's sort of interesting. Those correlations are really tiny there on the other two conditions. But basically, um, in the no hand and stranger hand condition, those were the areas that did go up more um, when a woman when the woman thought that she was about to be shocked. So there's a soothing sort of effect happening here by holding your spouse's hand, and it's better. It depends on the relationship that you have. The higher the quality of the relationship, the more you feel this positive effect of having your spouse hold your hand. 
Now that was in 2006, and then in 2019, then in, then in 2019, there was this follow-up study that was published in the journal Pain, which is a really top medical journal in, in, in pain research. And what they looked at here was 30 healthy women and their male partners in a committed and monogamous romantic relationship for at least three months, right? So they're not just picking married couples this time. So you just have to be in a committed relationship, heterosexual, monogamous for at least three months. They first come into the lab and both the man and the woman ended up going through this thermal pain calibration session in which heat was presented to their skin at 47, 47 degrees. So it's like this hot little piece of metal is touched to your skin. And they wanted to make sure that everybody felt that as being painful. And they would ask them to rate on a scale from zero to 100, where 100 is the worst imaginable pain. They had to at least rate that stimulus at at least 20. And if it wasn't, they would just turn it up a little bit to make it more, a little more painful. Or if it was too high, they could turn it down a little bit, like to 46 degrees. But the point was that this was to be a noxious stimulus, something that they wouldn't want to feel, okay? Then in the scanner, this same heat stimulus is going to be presented to their left forearm while they're in the scanner and while their partner holds their hand or not. This is a within subjects design. And you can see in the picture there on the right what happens in the first fMRI run. They're going to be in the scanner four times during that run. They're going to be presented that hot stimulus to their arm. It's painful, right? It's at least a 20 on that 0 to 100 scale. And they're not holding anybody's hand. In fact, they just put like an inert device um, something like a like a little thing you could hold on to, like a little uh, squee a squee a, sorry a squeezy little thing that you could hold on to, and you can see that they hold on to that, and then they get four pain trials. Then you can see in the second run, the husband or sorry the boyfriend just or whoever this partner is, he puts his hand out and he holds her hand, and then she gets four pain trials. The third run is another one of those where the partner is holding the hand, and again she's going to get four pain trials. And finally, the fourth run was four pain trials with the inert device in her hand, okay? So that's all what she does. And then she's gonna rate, again, three self-report things. She's gonna rate how intense the pain was, she's gonna rate how unpleasant the pain was, and how much emotional comfort she felt. And so what you can see here are these behavioral results from these three um, self-reports. So up at the top, the three graphs are showing us that in the baseline, which is when they just have that inert substance in her hand that she's holding on to, compared to the pink where she's holding her partner's hand, that the pain intensity actually is no different. There's not really a, much of a difference there. Um, I think it's a slight decline, but in terms of um, intensity, it's pretty much the same. But there are bigger differences there for pain unpleasantness. So when she's got the partner holding her hand and she feels those four trials of pain, she actually rates them as being less unpleasant, right? So her unpleasantness ratings are lower. And emotional comfort, you can see, is also significantly higher when she's holding her partner's hand. And interestingly, another thing you can see down there in the lower right corner is that this was related to relationship quality, that they had more emotional comfort the more they felt that their relationship was good. So they had also completed something like the dyadic adjustment scale where they could look at the relationship quality between these two people. And the more the relationship quality goes up, the more they feel comforted by having their hand held. Now, what about the fMRI? Well, what they did in this particular study, because this is many years later from the original 2006 study, is that they examined what's known as the neurological pain signature. And so because they had these stimuli during the baseline condition, where they just presented pain, they could look across the whole brain and see what that pattern of brain activity was when the person feels pain. This seems to be a better approach than just trying to find one local area that's the pain um, area. Instead, each person seems to have a sort of subjectively different way that they respond to pain. So they've come up with this thing called the neurological pain signature that's been used in a lot of other studies to develop the unique pattern that that particular participant has in response to pain. And what they did was once they could establish that, then they looked at what happened in terms of them having their um, hand held, and they found that the hand holding did reduce this signature response during pain. So they could see that the same areas that lit up when their hand was not being held um, could be their signature to how they feel when they get pain. And now that same signature pattern drops, it's reduced when she's holding her partner's hand. So when you put it all together in this study, um, it's, it's, 
a really well done study. And again, if you have the time, you might want to look it up. It's um, you can see there they're looking at relationship quality seems to matter. Emotional comfort is associated with the partner during the hand holding leads to lower feelings of pain intensity and lower pain unpleasantness. But down on the bottom, they have like sort of the brain mechanisms. And you can see that there's a, a reduction when the guy is holding their hand in terms of their NPS. And they have all this stuff about the connectivity also um, is talked about in the article. And they also probably point out that there's sort of like these um, prefrontal areas that also seem to mediate um, the feelings of basically if your rest of your brain is telling you you're not feeling as much pain, then your um, prefrontal areas basically are seem to be what drives your feelings, your subjective feelings that your pain intensity or your pain unpleasantness is lower. And so that's what they're trying to show there in that um, picture. So in the end, Lingering questions about the study is, first of all, like how similar are these hand-holding effects to other manipulations of cognitive demand and attentional diversion? So is it just because they're having their hand held um, that was distracting and that caused them to um, have less pain? We don't know from this one study. We do know from that 2006 Cone study that he was able to show that having a stranger there didn't really have a lot of impact, having a stranger hold her hand. But what about other things you could do to distract them? Like what if you showed them funny cartoons or um, made them laugh, told them jokes? Would that have the same sort of effect of having hand holding going on? So it might not anything be about touch. It could just be about hand, uh, about being distracted. Why does the relationship quality matter? And what's the mechanism there? That's interesting across a couple different studies now, you can see that how good the relationship is, is having an impact on how the brain responds to things. And we don't really understand that very well. Like what's all that input? There must be stuff coming from memory about how much you can rely on this person. And maybe there's some of the items that are in the relationship quality measure tap into different sort of inputs from your brain about the relationship. And then that mediates how you respond when they hold your hand. Would this also work for just a good friend or a family member? We don't have a control here. We don't know if it's just something about somebody you have a romantic relationship with. We also don't know about men. So in these studies, they tend to use women and women are used a lot more in pain studies than in men because women uh, tend to report more pain uh, clinically. And so we don't really know what would happen if you did this with men in a scanner. And finally, couldn't this be done in um, maybe in combined uh, with that approach of microneurography of touch? You might remember back at lecture two, I talked about this sort of new method here where you can actually do single cell recording of um, by sticking little needles into a person's arm. And they use that to really look at uh, sensitivity of touch. You can actually see um, when you go ahead and brush their skin with like a little uh, brush that you can see. Uh, the nerves actually start to fire and send sensations back to your brain. Maybe you could combine some of this work about like whether or not it's the touch of your partner versus a touch of a stranger and see if right there the action potentials are different from those neurons and then they give feedback to the brain. So lots of interesting future research could be done on the importance of touch. So that's all I have for this uh, lecture. All that touchy-feely stuff. We talked about hemo human chemo signals. We've talked about breastfeeding, the smell of tears. Um, which, you know, as I said, I'm not really very convinced is really a finding there. We've talked about MHC compatibility and smelling and sort of the complications of that research. We talked about love and how there's really a dearth of studies, really, really good studies on what goes on with love. And then finally, we've been talking about this really important, interesting research about the importance of touch by loved ones. So that's all I have for this lecture, and I look forward to seeing you at the next lecture.